Amen. Let's be seated. <clears throat> Let's get right straight to God's word this morning. Revelation 19. <clears throat> Revelation 19. Um, let me take it from verse 6 and we'll read all the way to verse 9. Verse 6. We are... <clears throat> And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true saints of God. Amen. <laughs> now I mentioned last week that every time God tells you, Write, you should pay attention. Amen. Because something big is coming something important is coming we began looking at um, the b attitudes uh, in revelation and last week we took the first three um, we'll just conclude <clears throat> with the remainder uh, today and we said of course there are seven of them uh, consistent with some of what you find in revelation I mean, many of us mentioned plenty sevens last week. Uh, so this is one of those sevens. And we said wherever that number has significance, um, that it's always a picture of completeness or perfection. And uh, we believe that that's the case uh, in this particular instance. So, beatitude number four. He says, he said unto me, write, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true sayings of God. As if somebody was doubting it. <laughs> so, it's a double affirmation. Not only should you write, but... I want you to know that what I'm asking you to write, they are the true sayings of God. And I want us to also approach it with that same mindset. These are the true sayings of God. So what you are reading here is not a joke. It's not a figment of somebody's imagination. It's not that Brother John out of his own feverish imagination because he couldn't think straight. He was in the island of Patmos and he just decided to write something. No. No. It is, it is a reality. It is true. It is perfect. Amen. Ah, but I want you to observe that in verse 7 he talked about the marriage of the Lamb has come. But verse 9 speaks about the marriage supper. Praise God. So, in verse 7, it says, the marriage of the Lamb has come. Right? And then in verse 9, he gives an announcement of something that is still coming. Are we together? Now, how many of us have attended weddings in recent times? You notice that today, just as it was back then, there's usually the main wedding and then you have a reception, right? Many times you decide, sometimes people say, well, I'm going for the reception, I'm not going for the church ceremony. While some will say, let me go for the church ceremony. I can't wait for the reception. And some will go 
for both. Because the two events, even though they are connected, but they are separate. And in fact, in many instances, they happen in separate locations. Are we following? All right. Now, don't forget that here in chapter 19, the bride is with him in heaven. Right? And he says that the marriage has come and his wife has made herself ready. And they gave her what? Fine linen to wear. Clean and white. Clean and white. As you go to verse 14 of that same chapter 19, you notice that the lamb is coming back to the earth. Praise God. He is returning to the earth. If you read from verse 11, the lamb in heaven is returning to the earth. And the Bible says that there's an army that follows him. Right? The army followed him upon white horses, clothed in what? In fine linen, clean and white. I think it's a safe assumption to say that it is his bride that is following him on those horses to return to the earth. Because you see that at the end of that chapter 19, he's coming to the earth to come and do battle. Are we together? He's coming to do battle here at Amagedon. So he's leaving heaven physically to come back to the earth. And those that were with him for the wedding in heaven are going to return with him to come here to do battle, first of all. And then as you enter chapter 20, what do you find? You find the millennial reign described. Are we together? I hope nobody is lost yet. Eh? I'm just trying to put, you know, block upon block, line upon line. So, the bride is with him in heaven. And in verse 7, it says that the marriage of the lamb has come. Amen. The marriage of the lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be clothed in fine linen, clean and white. And that fine linen is what? The, the righteous. righteous <laughs> some other versions will say the righteous acts of the saints. The righteous acts of the saints. Amen. But what about verse 9? Verse 9 now says to us, it says, Blessed are those that are invited to what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Now, normally, you know that. A bride is not invited to her wedding. Eh? What? My wife invited me, sir, <laughs> for her wedding. <laughs> but, but, but normally, a bride or even the bridegroom does not need an invitation to his own wedding or her own wedding. It is other people that are invited to the wedding. Are we following? Is anybody confused? Okay. So, as a first step, this invitation is not for the bride. Am I creating a problem? <laughs> Blessed are those who are invited to come to the, reception, the wedding reception. Oh, it says that those people are blessed. We're going to find out 
why this is so. And whether, I know many of us grew up, I also, for many years, I always assumed that the marriage supper is going to happen up there. <clears throat> but I've changed my mind and I'll show you. Amen. If I remember, and it's not, it's not a big deal. You can believe otherwise. I remember a servant of God uh, in this country who said, um, one year, he just told his family, and in fact the church, he told them, Jesus is not going to come this year. Ah, and they were looking at him strangely. He said, Jesus will not come this year. And he said, how did he know? He said, because he saw, God opened his eyes, and he saw a vision. And he saw that angels were in heaven. They were setting up the venue for the marriage supper. Are, you, are we following? They were arranging the hall and they were far from ready. They were not yet ready. They were just beginning to make preparation. So on that basis, he said, Jesus will not come this year. Of course, again, um, <laughs> that comes from the understanding that that's where it is going to happen. Amen. But let's leave that aside. But notice that First of all, the wedding has come and it is happening there. Because for all of us who have been blood-bought and baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, at the rapture, we are all going to be taken. Are we following? We are all going to be what? Taken. And we will meet with the Lord in the air and return with him to the Father's house. Am I communicating? I'm not teaching on that, so I just need to run over it. So all of us would have gone and we will be there. And at the judgment seat of Christ, we would have been assessed for the purpose of rewards. And then, at the end of that exercise, we will receive what? Our robes. And then, when he is returning, we are returning here with him. Are we together? Is it clear? We are returning here with him. And an announcement is given. Blessed are those that are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, the marriage has happened. Don't forget that while we are here, we are only betrothed to Christ. Eh? We are only betrothed to him. The marriage will happen up there. But it says that as the fourth beatitude, blessed are those that are invited to come for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, this is a true saying. Amen. So, it means that when he returns, oh, there's going to be some measure of festivity to celebrate his union to his bride. Amen. You remember one day, Jesus was invited to the house of a Pharisee. In Luke 14. And as they were speaking. In verse 15. One man just shouted. <laughs> Blessed is he. That shall eat bread. In the kingdom of God. Do you remember that? Just check. It's there. It's in your Bible. Verse 15. Yes. And when one of them that sat at meat with him. Heard these things. He said unto him. Blessed is he that shall eat bread. In the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I hope you understand that when he's saying kingdom of God, he's not talking about some nebulous concept, some otherworldly, mysterious thing. He's speaking, they're speaking about the millennial kingdom, the literal kingdom of God on earth. Are we together? And he said, blessed is he that shall eat bread in that kingdom. 
And Jesus did not refute it. You know, unlike the other times that we've seen that somebody interjected Jesus and Jesus just, you know, packed aside what they said. This time around, Jesus did not directly say, you are wrong or you shouldn't have spoken like that. What he rather did was to now bring a parable and said a certain man made a great supper. Right? And then he invited many. Remember the man said, blessed is he that will eat bread. Now Jesus is now giving him another perspective. Amen. So he made a great supper. He invited many to come. And then everybody started giving excuse. The first person said, oh, um, I have bought a piece of ground. Yes. And I must needs go and see it. Please hold on. Now, what were they invited for? Was it breakfast? Was it lunch? Supper. Supper. It was supposed to be an evening or night meal. Now, this man says he has bought a piece of ground and he wants to go for land inspection at night. At night. Are, we, are we together? I know we have some people that are real estate <laughs> agents here. When somebody wants to buy property, please, do you take them to go and see it at night? No. <laughs> okay. Now, the second person said, ah, I, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. Ah, uh, ah, uh, wait, oh, wait. If you buy a second hand car, I'm not talking of brand new. If I even brand new, you're allowed to at least test, right? But if you're buying second, I don't want to call it the other name. <laughs> so that, Amen. <laughs> Normally, you must test drive. Now, this man has bought five yoke. These are agricultural instruments. Five yoke. That's ten oxen. Because a yoke is two. You know, so he said, I have bought it. I'm, I must go and prove it. How do you buy something first before you go and test it? You see that it doesn't make sense, right? Okay. The last person said, I have married a oh, wife. I, have mar I know many people usually think this is a very valid, it's a valid excuse. Eh? But <laughs> that sounds, sounds okay. I mean, the man has joined, fact, even under the law, he said, if a man has gotten married, he should have one year to take care of his wife. He shouldn't go to battle. <laughs> but wedding was not included. But the other reason why that excuse is useless is that in Jewish culture, from the point of betrothal to the point of marriage, it usually took one year. So typically, from the point you are betrothed, you already have an idea of when your wedding will take place. And when they gave you the invitation, don't forget that he didn't just go to them at the time of supper to invite. He had invited them before and they had confirmed that they will attend. It is those who had confirmed that they will attend. When it was time, he said, go and invite them again. Are we together? So you already had an idea at least one year ago of when you'll be married. So when they came to you with the invitation, at the first time, you would have respectfully declined. Are we following? So the truth of the matter is, none of these excuses were valid. Like somebody has said, there are not enough crutches in this world for all the lame excuses people give. Amen. So he's saying that there's no excuse a man will have that will suffice for not honoring God's invitation. Right? 
Even though he has said, oh, blessed are they that are invited to the supper. Praise God. But these guys were also invited. And, you know, in a similar but not the same story in Matthew 22. Remember, this one was a king who made a feast for his son. His son had gotten married. Right? Same excuses. Same excuses. Until the king said, go and bring other people. And they brought them. And somehow, one guy <laughs> entered and did not wear a wedding gown. You know, you, know, you know the reason why he was condemned? Tradition also has it that whenever an, a king in the Eastern tradition invites you for a wedding, you must wear a shoebi. They will give you. It's part, of, it's part of his generosity. All of you, wear this for me. And the guy refused to wear. And the master came and said to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither? Amen. Friend. That's the same word Jesus used to call Judas. It's not, if you check the root word, it's not philos. Philos means dear friend. But here he called him hetairos. It just means comrade, acquaintance. That's the same word Jesus called Judas when he came to kiss him. He didn't call him Philos, dear friend. No. So he said, friend, how did you come in hither? That's also the same word he used in that parable of the householder when that guy complained that eh, we have worked since money. You now gave us the same thing. He said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Same word, not Philos. Amen. Are we together? So he said to him, how did you come in here without that garment? And he said, bind him hand and foot and fling him out. Amen. Now, why do I know that this event is going to happen here? Oh, there are a number of statements Jesus will make. Do you remember when he met the centurion? And after the man spoke, in Matthew 8, Jesus said, Ah, I have not seen. So Jesus marveled and said, I have not seen such great faith. No, not in Israel. And he said, I tell you that many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Are we following? Now, this was a Gentile. And the people that the kingdom was meant for, Jesus said, even they, some of them will miss it. And these people will come from east, from the west, and they will recline at the table. That's a sitting position when they are about to eat. So, there's clearly going to be a meal. Right? And people will gather around. Are we together? Amen. Now, Jesus made some very cryptic remarks which many times we don't pay attention to during the Passover. Amen. Which will happen in this week, at least in our time. Jesus made some very cryptic remarks. Let's go to Luke, it's Luke 22 from verse 15. Let's read to 18. Luke 15. 22. Yes. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Yes. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Hang on. Did you hear what he said? This Passover I am eating with you, I will not eat it again until it happens in the kingdom of, in the millennium. Are you following that? I will not eat it again until it happens in the millennium. Yes, go on. Go ahead. And he took the cup yes. and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, 
I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Uh -uh. Are you saying this? He said, I will not again drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes, until the millennium comes. There's clearly something that is going to happen in the millennium. Amen. Because he's saying, I won't do it until then. I won't do it until then. Amen. Read verse 30. Verse 30. 30. Yes. That ye may eat and drink at the table in my kingdom. Are you hearing that? He's talking to the disciples. Started by saying, ye are they which have, which have been with me in my temptations. And I appoint you a kingdom as my father has appointed me. Blah, 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 blah. And he says that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. So there's an eating and a drinking. Let's look at it in Mark 14. There's a way Mark 14 puts it. Verse 25. Mark 14, 25. 25. Yes. Verily I say unto you, yes. I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Aha. <laughs> Amen. He says, I will not until it happens again in the kingdom of God. So if this is a reference to the millennium, as I suppose it is, then it's clearly pointing us to the fact that that supper, that's marriage supper to commemorate his wedding to his bride will happen here in the kingdom. And so John the Baptist could say that I am a friend of the bridegroom. Amen. Not the bride, a friend of the bridegroom because all of them are going to come you know, to feast at that table to rejoice with the lamb who has been married to his bride. Amen. Amen. So, everyone who participates in it, whether as the bride or as an invited guest who has honored the invitation, oh, that person is blessed because he has entered his rest forever. Amen. Are we together? So, blessed are those that are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And from other passages, we are adding that for those who give flimsy excuses for not responding to the call of God, there's no excuse that will do. None whatsoever. And somebody will say, eh, if the king wanted me to come, why didn't he come by himself? Why should he send servants? But the truth of the matter is, God always sends servants. He will always send servants. So when you hear somebody preaching in the bus, oh, that's the servant that was sent. He said, let the king come. He will not come. He has decided that the instrumentality for bringing men to that supper is servants. Is servants. And the way the servants are treated, oh, like those ones who killed some of the servants, he went and destroyed their cities. Of course, literally it happened with the Jews. Amen. Everyone who has received an invitation so, even as I'm preaching, it's an invitation. That is God's great invitation. And it goes out to everyone. So, he will say, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, first of all, whether I am part of the bride or I am part of the invited guests, you must make the lists. Amen. You must make the list. 
because this is one of the blessings. One of the seven wonderful blessings God packed in this small book and said, I mean, let, me, let it not just be a book of, oh, this vision, that vision. Mm-mm. Let me also talk in some blessings inside it for as many as we lay hold of it and run with it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Have we understood so far? All right, I need to run <laughs> as much as I would love to stay there. Now, in chapter 20, remember I said to us that chapter 20 deals with, I mean, if you follow the chronology, I mentioned last week that the book of Revelation, there are very few things that are new inside it. Do you remember? I said very few things, and in fact, the things that are new inside it are particularly in chapter 21 and 22. What Revelation did was to gather all the things scattered throughout the Bible and put them in some sort of sequence. Are we following? And that's the reason why God promises a blessing for the reading of the book. Because for you to understand it, you must be familiar with the rest of the Bible. And that's why people don't understand it. Because they're not familiar. There's hardly anything new. In fact, some would say that you have over 500 references, even if not direct, to the Old Testament in this single book. The imageries, you can't understand them if you are not familiar with the rest of the Bible. That's why there's a blessing for the reading and the keeping of it. Because for you to understand, you must, be, you must have a working knowledge, especially of the Old Testament. Without that, you will just be, in fact, it will, it will look as if you are having a headache as you are reading it. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Are we together? So, if you follow that chronology, chapter 19, we have just left. The Lord has returned to the earth. Right? And then in chapter 20, we now have the thousand years. In fact, between verse 1 and verse 7, you'll see that the thousand years are mentioned six times. Six times. It's not a mistake. Because there are some brothers who say, who, who say that, well, the thousand years is not, is not literal. It's just any time, any length of time. Hallelujah. But those of us who are um, pre-millennialists, if we understand what that means, <laughs> believe that there's going to be a literal 1,000 year reign of Jesus on this earth. Amen. Where for the first time you are going to have universal peace, righteousness, prosperity, and you know the reason why? is because Satan is going to be bound. Eh? <laughs> you know, some of our brothers are very funny. Some will say, ah, no, Satan, Satan is not going to be bound at that time. Satan has been bound already when Jesus first came. Are you following me? And the question, ah, what about the fact that they said he has been chained? They said, yes, even though he has been chained, he can still move around. In fact, somebody wrote, that the chain with which he is bound is a long one, giving him freedom of movement. <laughs> and it's a very simple thing. Because if you read, you notice that he said, not only was the chain brought, the man, the, I mean, Satan was bound with the chain. Not only is he bound, they carried him and put him Inside the bottomless pit, sealed it, shut him up, shut him inside there. So, which which long rope are you talking about? So, there's that's like solitary confinement. I don't know how many of us have seen prison movies. Prisoners can move inside the prison, but if the prisoner is troublesome, they'll carry him and put him inside solitary confinement, lock him. So, that one. Even though other prisoners can move around inside within that circumference, 
His own is limited. So that's what is happening to Satan. His complete confinement so that he will no longer deceive the nations for that 1,000 years. Are we together? Now, look at verse 4. Verse this four. is after he has come. Yes. And I saw thrones, yes. and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Yes, read to six. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Verse six. Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. Hallelujah. On such, the second death had no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> ah, this is the first resurrection. And blessed, not only blessed and holy, is he that has a part in that first resurrection. Because the second death has no power over such. Hallelujah. Now, so, Jesus returns to the earth and John says, I saw thrones and they sat on them. Who do you think is occupying those thrones? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And Jesus, Jesus promised, I think the church in Sardis and in Laodicea, about sitting on thrones. He said it also to his apostles that in the regeneration, Matthew 19, I think 28, in the regeneration, he says that you will sit with me on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Amen. Praise God. Now, so judgment is to be meted out here. And he said, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the word of God. Now, when you run to chapter 6, under the, when the fifth seal is opened, there are some people that are killed. And John said, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been killed. And they were asked to, they gave them white robes, and they were asked to rest until the rest of their brethren are killed. Right? Now, we now come to chapter 20, and we are seeing the rest. Right? All of them now, it says that, all, all of them that had not received the mark. He said, and they lived. That's a resurrection. Amen. They came to life. They came to life. That's small, small Greek word. The ezesan, E-Z-E-S-A-N. Means to resurrect. They came to life. Jesus used that same word for himself in 2.8. I am he that was dead, but I am alive. That same word. I have come back to life. You see that same word used for the Antichrist in 13 verse 14. He said, he that had the wound of the sword and lived. The same word. Amen. So this word is speaking to a resurrection. He said, all of them, they, lived, they came to life. At the point of death, of course, you know it is their bodies that died. So, here, what happens? They literally resurrect with a new body. They came to life and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. So, we are looking at who here? Tribulation saints. Those who died during the tribulation, but who were rightly related to God but we're not a part of the rapture company. Are we? I hope we're not confused. Okay, they were not a part of the rapture company, but they were here through the tribulation, too, and some were killed. 
for their witness to Jesus in that process. He says, all of them will be what? Resurrected. They came to life. Last week, I mentioned something cryptic. I just left it about Daniel. The last verse of Daniel. The last verse of his life. Which I said, ah, I wish my last verse would be like that. They told him, Daniel, go and rest. Don't worry. You are fine. Go and rest. Eh? You, will, you will rest. And at the end of the days, the days spoken of in that whole vision, the days of the tribulation, at the end of the days, you will stand in your lot. Hallelujah. You will stand. What has been earmarked and apportioned for you, you will stand in it. You will stand in resurrection. You will stand in it. Amen. And I said at the end of that period, which is the end of the tribulation, Daniel, alongside all other Old Testament saints, will be raised back to life to enter the millennial kingdom in their bodies to reign with Jesus. And they told Daniel, you will stand in your lot. And I said, you know, his tribe has an allotment of land in that, in that place. And I told us Ezekiel 48 talked about the allotment of the entire land, of the full scope of the land of promise, as God told Abraham. All of it recovered. And each of them given portions. That's why when Jesus returns, the elect, if you, if you follow the context, the elect that is Israel, Matthew 24, they will be gathered from all the four corners of the world and brought. The reason is that that land is for them. That's why they are being brought there. So that God will fulfill all he promised to the patriarchs concerning the entire scope of the promised land. That's why they are going to be brought back there. I hope I have not confused us. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> Amen. So, he said that this resurrection that is happening at the return of Jesus to the earth, not the resurrection at the rapture, eh? the resurrection at the rapture is for church age saints, the dead in Christ. The dead in Christ. In, that expression is always used for those who from the day of Pentecost until the return of the Lord have been baptized into the body of Christ, into that mystical union of the bride and the bridegroom into one body. Amen. So, at the rapture, they are taken. But every man in his own order, like Paul says. So, there's an order to the resurrection. There's an order. So, there are different troops. There are different companies. Amen. So, this company we are finding here, he says that this resurrection that is happening, he says this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has a part in that resurrection. But the question should be, Jesus has risen from the dead. Am I correct? When he rose from the dead, remember Matthew 27 said, some people, a few, some of the saints came up from the grave after his resurrection. Okay? It had to be after, not before. They came up after his resurrection and went into the holy city and showed themselves to many. Are we together? Now, if that has happened, so how can this one, which is happening many, many years after, be first resurrection? And when you go to Acts 26, I think verse 23, you would hear Paul when speaking before Felix. He says that, it was prophesied that Christ should be the first to rise from the dead. 
Am I correct? Please check. Just that Christ <laughs> should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. That he should be the first to rise from the dead. So if he is to be the first, why is this subsequent resurrection called the first? He should be maybe fourth. Because you know, after Jesus rose, you had those people that came up after his resurrection, right? The rapture is going to happen and church age saints are going to be taken, they're going to be resurrected. The two witnesses in Revelation 11 are also going to be killed and three days after, they'll rise. Right? So, all of these resurrections would have happened before this one. So how can this one be the first resurrection? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Are we enjoying this? <laughs> now, it is first. Are we together? It is first not in chronology. It is first in kind. It is first not in sequence. It is first in kind. Are we following? You see that word first? The Greek word there is prote, P-R-O-T-E. When you hear Paul saying that this um, is a good saying and acceptable to all, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That word is the same word. Are we following? Of whom I am chief. Not that I am the first person to be a sinner, but I am the chief. So you can say that this is the chief resurrection. Does it make sense? Are we following now? So you and you will find that there are many other scriptures that speak about this same resurrection. In Luke 14, 14, Jesus told those people, that Pharisee in his house, he said, when you have a feast, go and invite the lame, the blind, the halt. They can't pay you, but you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Amen? In Hebrews 11.35, the author would say that women receive their dead back to life. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So the first resurrection is a better resurrection. It is the resurrection of the just. Are we following? Eh? And in Luke 24, 15, you hear Paul talk about the resurrection generally. He says that even the Jews allowed it under their culture that there shall be a resurrection both of the just and the unjust. Amen. So clearly the first resurrection is the resurrection of the just, which Jesus has spoken to in Luke 14, 14. Amen. And in Daniel 12, Daniel is told that at the end of the period he's speaking about that there shall be a resurrection. Some to life, some to damnation. Eh? Some are resurrected to life, some are resurrected to damnation. So the first resurrection is the resurrection unto life. Amen. And Jesus speaking in John 5. I hope I'm not giving too many scriptures. But speaking in John 5, you hear Jesus saying in verse 28, he said, the hour is coming when those that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they will come forth some to life, some to what? To condemnation. So the first resurrection is the resurrection unto life. Amen. So it is not necessarily first in sequence. It is first in kind. It is a type of resurrection because there are two kinds. Are we following? So every resurrection 
that has preceded this one, the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection of those saints that came up from the grave and went and showed themselves in the city, inside Jerusalem, most likely they must have died within that generation so that people could recognize them. Okay? <clears throat> so, that resurrection, the resurrection of church age saints at the rapture, the resurrection of the two witnesses, and then the resurrection of Old Testament saints and tribulation saints, all of them put together constitutes the first resurrection. Because whoever partakes of it is blessed. Hallelujah. Does it make any sense? So, what determines participation in the first resurrection is right relationship with Jesus. At whatever point in that spectrum you find yourself is right relationship. And that's why when a believer dies, oh, yes, humanly speaking, there will be cause for sorrow. But Paul would say, don't sorrow like those who don't have hope. He's not saying don't sorrow, but don't sorrow like those who don't have hope. Because that person is blessed. And I said last week that, look, circumstances, well, they're not, they're not really important to God. What is important is, did the man die in Christ? Or did he die outside Christ? Is he perishing? Or is he going to experience, is he a candidate for the first resurrection? Because, oh, that person is blessed. Hallelujah. He is blessed. As many as will pass. He said, on such, the second death does not have power. It has lost its grip. It has lost its power. Amen. So, the first death can have power. That one is sleeping. But the second death, it will not come near him. Because <laughs> the Son of God lives in his heart. Hallelujah. So Jesus said, or God says, blessed and holy is he that has a part in that resurrection. He's blessed. Amen. Now, the sixth reference. <clears throat> 22, 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. I'll read it together with number 7, which is in verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have rights to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. No wonder if any cross be sang that in. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white. He will lead me where no tears will ever fall. Hallelujah. <laughs> Through the gates into the city. The eternal new Jerusalem. Amen. Blessed are they that do. Now, notice that, like I said last week, the Beatitudes seem to bracket the whole book of Revelation. So you find the first one at the beginning and the first one is dealing with being blessed for reading, for hearing and keeping. Now we have come to the end of the book. It puts another blessing again and says blessed are those that keep his commandments. Hallelujah. Blessed are those that keep his so as if there is an unusual emphasis on keeping. Amen. There's an emphasis on keeping, keeping, keeping. Beyond the things we see inside, beyond the symbols, beyond the signs, do you keep what is written? I've forgotten who was saying last week, or was it the week before last, 
that scripture that the former things of Theophilus have I written of the, all the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Amen. Both to do and to teach. You hear him say in Matthew 5 that, that whosoever does these sayings of mine and teaches men to do it is blessed. And the one that does not do, so there's an emphasis on the doing and then the teaching. Amen. Praise the Lord. Doing, doing, doing. Put it to practice. Put it to life. So that it does not remain purely as mental exercise. If that's all God intended, he has wasted our time. If it was just to gather all the head knowledge in this world. Oh, I know that uh, Antichrist is going, is going, to, going, to, going, to, be going to do that. But in daily living, we can't see it. In daily living, it does not reflect in the way you relate in your neighborhood, in your place of work. We are not seeing the life of Christ. Then, what is the essence? It's purposeless. So, it's wonderful to know, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to be raptured. Oh, this is how it's going to happen. Oh, uh, these are all the people in the, in the first resurrection. These are all the companies of resurrection. Brother, if it does not affect the way you live, you would have only wasted your time. If it does not make you say, because of this thing, I will not walk in strife. Because of this thing, I will not keep malice. Because of this thing, I will not walk in immorality. Because of this, I will not steal my office money. What then is the purpose? Hallelujah. What then is the purpose? Praise God. <laughs> you know, before you even get to that verse 14, I like, I like the way it ended in 11. He said, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. Amen. So, he has pushed <laughs> the ball to your court. Amen. In spite of all the many, many, many wonderful things we have talked about. Oh, the millennium is literal. Oh, is this. Satan is going to be bound. All that, as wonderful as it is, if it does not become lifestyle, or like I usually say, if belief does not translate to behavior. If doctrine does not translate to duty. If privilege does not translate to responsibility. We have wasted our time. Because the entire Bible rests on those two legs. Okay? It rests on those two legs. Doctrine, duty. Belief, behavior. That's the only way to be a balanced person. Not just that, oh, I have this in Christ. I have that in Christ. I have the life of God in me. But we are continually living a lie. Amen. So, seven wonderful blessings packaged for us. Packaged for us. And I trust the Lord that as he opened those blessings with responsibility and closed them with responsibility that we will walk in the light of those responsibilities. We will not be like those that gave excuses why they cannot attend what was freely given. Free. Free. They were not asked to bring anything. Just come. Everything is ready. And 
excuses that will not hold up as far as eternity is concerned as those people gave. Praise the Lord. That like those women that he said, look, they obtained, they received their death to life and that some people even endure torture to the point that they had opportunity to be delivered but that opportunity would have meant that they would have denied Jesus. They said, no, I would rather suffer so that I can obtain a better resurrection. So that's why you hear Paul say that if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection, not resurrection of the dead, resurrection from among the dead. That's the Greek word. There's an ek there. Resurrection from among the dead, leaving the rest of the dead there. Because the rest of the dead, as you saw, will not rise until after the millennium. And all of them are partakers of the second resurrection and the second death. But Paul said he wanted to experience an out-resurrection. Amen. How many of us look forward to that? How many of us? <laughs> I shall know him, I shall know him. And redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him. By the prince of the nails in his hand. When my life's work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. of have you are you are you just giving God all the excuses in this life and you hear the Lord say that excuse will not do on that day it will not do on that day have you been sitting somewhere 
and Jesus has been nudging you, go and join the choir. Go and join one department. And you say, well, I don't have the time for it. Maybe you hear Jesus saying this morning, that excuse will not do on the day of judgment. You say, oh, maybe I don't have clothes. I can't stand on the pulpit because I don't have clothes. And Jesus says, your excuse will not hold up. It will not hold up. Are you looking forward? Are you looking forward to participating in that first resurrection? The better resurrection. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. <clears throat> some of us who may have put off the coming of the Lord for some of us who may have grown weary in waiting for your coming Lord let there be fresh hope renewed hope renewed hope fresh hope the hope of our calling let it be revived in every heart in the name of Jesus Lord, I ask for strength for the feeble knees on this journey. The hands that are hanging down as your word has come, let it bring a lift. In the name of Jesus, bring a renewed body for souls upon us. A renewed body for souls to draw men in. Rekindle those flames in our hearts. Rekindle it in our hearts, O oh God, that we will live as pilgrims, men who are traveling to this celestial Zion. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I ask that as many as are asking you for a fresh encounter this morning, Lord, visit them in the name of Jesus. Those brothers on the road to Emmaus, they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he yet spake with us on the way? Lord, I ask for burning hearts. Not just burning hearts, but hearts to whom you will be revealed in the name of Jesus. Unveil yourself, Lord, afresh to us. Let us see you again in the name of Jesus that it may affect our walk with you. It may affect our relationship with you and it will help us conduct our affairs on this side as men who are waiting indeed for you. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord.